Look alive, haunters. You are entering a story about Geist, the Sin Eaters. Welcome to the Chroniclers of Darkness, a narrative horror podcast set in the RPG New World of Darkness. Due to adult language and the violent nature of the stories told, this podcast is rated M for Mature, and we strongly encourage listener discretion. Episode 5, Black Bone Serenade. You've seen this in every horror movie. Our heroine is wounded, her back against the wall, the monster looming over her, and I'm told by movie buffs that I'd be an awful final girl. I'm too blonde, I'm too sexually active, I'm too old. Someone like me usually ends up sacrificing themselves near the end of the movie. At least, that's what men say. And you know what? Men are idiots. I am on my back in the common area of a cluster of homes. Leslie Sherman is unleashing the end of times as other Sin Eaters are swarmed with zombies. Standing above me is the rotted body of the friend I've spent the good part of two years searching for. There's a branch jammed in my thigh holding back a tide of my blood. Times like these, I wish my keystone were a shotgun or a shield. All I have is a fan tucked into my bra strap. So I pull it out and flick it open. And nothing happens. Nothing happens, even though Charlie disrupted whatever spell Leslie was casting. This means my geist is willingly holding back, forcibly doing nothing to help me. Zombie Robbie falls on top of me, his hands on my throat, pressure in my head, need to breathe, need to flick the fan again. Nothing from Blackbone Daddy. He simply hovers above, imposing his ribcage over both of us like drapes from a bed in a honeymoon suite. Motherfucker, I say to everyone and to no one. I try to remember that self-defense class from years ago. Clamp the wrists together, roll his weight away, knee him somewhere, anywhere. I get up, limping, trying to use ectoplasm to heal my leg and my guy still won't help. This is not the time. Zombie Robbie is getting back up. A few more zombies branch off from the main swarm and turn toward me. I shoulder check the iron gate open and hop to Charlie's car. Charlie had the keys. Fuck. I need something. A weapon. And that's when I feel it hit my hand. Heavy metal, slick with sweat and blood. The general's saber hilt. Basically a metal boxing glove. I remember Robbie could summon a sword with it, but it'll be different with me. The Blackbone Daddy wants me to hit Robbie with his old keystone. So callous, cruel, so apropos. What powers did I gain from this death mask? I spent so long pushing my geist out of my mind, who are totally out of sync. All my life I've pushed people away. Time to make a connection. I'm sorry, Robbie. My friend's body lurches toward me with an open mouth, and I'm the hilt, and plasm leaks into it. My hand is quivering from adrenaline as he's five feet away, four feet, three feet. Then he moves to the side and punches out the driver's side window. He unlocks the doors and motions for me to get in. The fuck do you think you're doing? Zombie Robbie tilts his head in that classic, sarcastic glare. We're outside Leslie's reach, so maybe Geist Robbie is possessing his old body? Like it's the weirdest thing that's happened tonight. I get into the driver's seat, zombie Robbie pats the steering wheel, and the car starts up. Good old Charlie. They had the car activate on a certain trigger in case something happened to them. Robbie's skin is turning gray, hardening, becoming lichen-crusted like a tombstone. I feel the car sink from sudden weight change, and I understand Robbie's plan. I turn the car toward the center of the lawn, facing the headlights against Leslie's rising body. Nice to have you back, Robbie, I say as I hit the gas. Charlie has nice taste in cars. Acura RSX can hit 60 miles per hour in 100 feet. Pumped with a little geist power? Let's find out. 
The car crunches through the gate and tears through the grass beneath us. We beeline straight for hovering Leslie, whose face twists in surprise. When we collide with him, a few things happen. The airbag swallows my sight, so I hear Robbie launch through the windshield, a torpedo made from gravestone. Leslie must have taken the hit dead on, because the mob of zombies start falling on top of each other. My body would have blacked out, but I'm a sin eater. We can't lose consciousness. It's a curse disguised as a blessing. Over the clutter of ghostly wings and clutching arms of zombies, I find Charlie trying to drag another Sin Eater out of the melee. My leg is bubbling plasm, healing over quickly, so I punch a zombie away with a saber hilt. Above me, the Blackbone Daddy cackles, thrusting his onyx cane into the chest of Charlie's assailant. The zombie's chest blows apart. Charlie sees it's me, and they don't look relieved. My Geist and I reach our hands down in unison, so Charlie and I get the hell out of there. They complain that I trash their car. I say, eye for an eye. I push Charlie toward the now gateless arch. Gotta make sure the tear Leslie made stays shut. Just don't know how I'm gonna do that. It's a terrible chasm in the center of a courtyard, a vacuum sucking light, color, and now zombies into its hungry maw. The Sin Eater crews are gathering their wounded and making a mad dash for the exit. Where's Leslie? Where's Zombie Robbie? I can hear a childlike screeching coming from the pit, something in pain but weirdly familiar. I don't know how good it's going to help, but the Blackbone Daddy and I reach out with our minds. And we push our passions into the thing beneath the world, feeding it calm, feeding it rest. It shrinks away, feeling satisfied. Then we reach into the sides of the pit, and we pull. Another Sin Eater joins us, then another, then another, and we lead them to the seal, the wound of the world shut. Somewhere, beyond the tear, another force reaches back to pull the wound shut. And we breathe deep the scent of the living world, shaking, strained, flooded with brain chemicals. I open the tunnel between our thoughts, and I invite him to feel my fear, my pain, and most intensely, my relief. This podcast is brought to you by Datamass, the alpha and omega in data analysis. In today's data-driven industry, it's important that you receive the best possible medical advice for you and your loved ones. Visit Datamass today and receive a free physical at one of our pop-up Datamass booths appearing in cities and town halls near you. Just look for the friendly inflatable yellow eagle and get yourself checked today. Datamass, because you know more than you think we know. This podcast is brought to you by Union National Securities, protecting you, yourself, and I. Union National Securities is an easy-to-follow two-hour online course which helps you identify all possible threats to your country and way of life. Call Union National Securities today for a free consultation from one of our security experts who will tell you why America isn't safe anymore. Union National Securities. Walls protect. Union National Securities is a recently acquired subsidiary and partner of Datamass. All contracts signed and data collected become property of Datamass and Datamass Enterprises. There's a crew of Sin Eaters called the Ambulance Chasers. They all work jobs for the city. One's a cop, one's an EMT, one lucky bastard runs a garbage truck. With a phone call, the team rushes towards Leslie's place. We have a shit ton of evidence to dispose of, after all. By the time dawn arrives, Charlie and I are back at Pete's Diner near the boulevard where we met a little over a week ago. They use their fork to trace lines into the pool of syrup on their plate. For obvious reasons, nobody wanted our help. We'd done enough. I'm healing from the car crash easily enough. And Charlie is doing something with their wounds. The puncture marks on their face are scabbing up nicely. Hey, Nix. I think we should split ways for now. Yeah, I mean, we're out of cars to ruin. <laughs> yeah. You were incredible. Do you know that? I'm not a hero, Charlie. I never said you were. Just take the compliment, you know? Words too big for the basic binary of good and evil. Whatever you did, 
regardless of intention? You blew me out of the water. They stand up, leave some cash on the table, and kiss me gently. It's important that we say goodbye properly. Goodbye, my friend. Not to me, spooky gooky. Charlie places Robbie's tape recorder on the table and presses the record button. Then they leave me alone to perform my eulogy. Every culture has a means of saying their final goodbyes. Burning Man Festival, burial at sea, buried in the earth. I've seen people give poetry readings at funerals, Bible verses, <laughs> songs from Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. For sin eaters, we know that there's power in these gestures. It's very concrete. The living can haunt the dead just as much as the dead haunt the living. But loss and recovering from it is a journey that takes time and attention. Sometimes you live with loss until it becomes its own emotion. You'll have dreams of your loved lost ones. You'll dream that they've dressed nicely and opened the gates to an amusement park for you and your cousins. Or you'll have the dream where they're downstairs in the kitchen waiting to surprise everyone with a fresh cup of coffee. Hey, Robbie, I say into the chipped and dented metal mesh of the speaker. It's Nix. I'm sorry for what happened with the general. I'm sorry I wasn't able to help you or put you to rest. I wish you the best with your unfinished business. If you are a geist, may you make the bargain with someone as honest and just as you were. I know the Pale Angel and Leslie are still out there somewhere, and I hope you chase them both like the devil himself. Thanks for everything, my friend. Rest in peace. The tape has stopped moving. Through a static feedback, I hear a southern accent whisper back, You too, Nix. In my hand, the recorder dissolves. It's plastic turning to black sand, then ashes, then they dissipate into the air. I blow away the ashes like the cold wind through a graveyard at winter, and a tear wets my cheek. Somewhere, an innocent is going to be at death's door, and Robbie Crutch will be waiting at the threshold, ready to carry them back home. Seven in the morning across my neighborhood. I'm facing the river. I pour some rum into my shot glass keystone and hold the sugary burn in my mouth. I can hear the muted trumpets and the distant snare drum. I think they're playing Birdland. In the shade of a tree, the black-boned daddy is wearing his gold necklaces and rings across his large fingers. He rattles in my mind and I answer back. You plotted behind my back, didn't you? That's how all the other Sin Eaters knew to show up. We both tried to double-cross each other, but you were given the chance to be rid of me. Why didn't you take it? I guess I'm not as cutthroat as you. We still have work to do. I don't understand you. <laughs> Bullies like you rarely understand their victims. But things can grow and change all the time. Leslie became more than a simple sin eater. Robbie became more than a man. I have to swallow the damn rum when the tongue goes numb. I risk a second shot and hold it, feeling the tingles in my cheeks. I will never be sorry for using your body. I will feel no shame running you ragged. Familiarity breeds contempt after all. We may be chained together, but there will always be people who have it worse. There are people I can help, with or without you. You use me, I'll use you right back. <laughs> very, 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 very well, then. There is plenty for us to learn and devour. Sherman's estate must be filled with mementos worthy of my power. And there are new ghosts born every day. Yet, 
You should take time to rest today. Why do you say that? Why would you even allow that? Tomorrow is Wednesday after all. My skin glows under the heat of the morning sun. I let myself feel a few things. Surprise. The burn of the rum. The blinding of the climbing sun. The reconciliation. And the hope. It's called dead weight for a reason. People think that ghosts are light. But in truth, we float through both worlds like flies trapped in molasses. It's a slog. Like wading through knee-deep mud or a humid Louisiana summer. We move slow because we can't change our emotional state. Everything we try to feel and think, it comes back to the one thought that keeps you from moving on. I could very well move on. I know that's what my friends would want. I know that's what Nick's would have wanted. Lingering before me is a train, and I'm on the platform facing it. This train has an elongated skull on its front. This train is just as much made from black smoke as it is pouring out black smoke. There are human-shaped shades wandering behind the windows, all too preoccupied to notice me. I could very well get on this train, and this train will deliver me. I feel it to my core, like stepping off a roof. All I have to do is surrender. I do not recognize my hands. They are hidden beneath thick black gloves. I cannot feel my feet through the boots or my chest beneath the long coat. I cannot feel my mouth beneath the metal plate across the bottom half of my face. I don't even know if there is a mouth anymore. The train begins to move. I hear metal scraping. I hear the fires inside flare up. But behind me I hear... A body has fallen. A body has fallen sloppily upon a linoleum floor. The thin clatter of metal tools follows shortly. That body did not deserve to fall. The train pulls away. I have already stepped off. I am in the basement of a hospital. A young woman lies crumpled. A tiny air bubble of blood sputters in her throat. She is wrapped in plastic, straightened out, and shoved into a long metal sheet which is rolled into a cooler. She does not deserve this. I hear her mind call out. I see her soul despair. Such a weight cannot be lifted, not by the self, not by the way she is now. She has work to do against the unseen thing that now leaves the morgue. I reach my hand to her beneath the plastic sheet. Her own blood is already cooling, steaming the wrap against her slick face. Hi. This, this doesn't, doesn't have, have to be the end. end. You, you are on your way to uncover a great truth. A truth, truth that, that would help the weak and punish, punish the wicked responsible. This is not your end. I reach into my coat for an object that has always been there, though this is the first time I feel it. I hand her the tape recorder. Her fingers clutch around it. This doesn't have to be your end. I can pull you back, but you'll need my help to challenge those in your way. This is the bargain. I am the Grey Fixer, and my power will become your power. So, for you to live again, I'm coming along for the ride. Do you accept my bargain? Chroniclers of Darkness is written and produced by Uncle Yo, with performances by Monica Blaze Levitt. Original music by Jimmy Lin. Logo by Jesse Pascal. Special thanks to Onyx Path Publishing for giving us a whole new world of darkness to haunt. Game on. Include everyone. And remember that death is only the beginning.